Hello and uh, welcome to the, this video today with myself, Fabrice, and Pascal. Hello, Pascal. Hello, Fabrice. So, uh, for those of you who don't know us at all, um, trained as an architect, visualizer for 25 years, teacher at uh, universities in Italy and in uh, the UK, and mainly using Unreal Engine as a software in 3D visualization. And Pascal, I'm a working cinematographer and uh, I began on film. I, I continue on uh, cinema, on, on, you know, electronic cinema and also in 3D worlds because I, I see a, a lot of uh, common ground on uh, when you talk about framing, lighting uh, between these three uh, supports, you know, these three formats. So uh, we will explore in, in uh, upcoming short videos a lot of uh, aspects of cinematography uh, applied in uh, the 3D world. And uh, the 3D world um, uh, makes it easy because it's real-time 3D to explain a complicated you know, concept in a very simple way. So, so Pascal and I have been conducting many uh, discussions around the subject of 3D and cinema and uh, visualization and re in real time using Unreal Engine. And uh, we thought we would start a new series of podcast style vlogs here uh, on YouTube on this channel uh, to explore some of the subjects uh, that we like to talk about. Because uh, let's face it, I think we're a little bit like little geeks around the subject and we, we can spend hours discussing uh, some very uh, fundamental and uh, light subjects around. So today we wanted to discuss uh, a very, very fundamental idea, which is the idea around framing. So I'll start with this uh, a little couple of sentences we wrote, which is the idea that framing is the first step to uh, creating a visual impact, whether it's uh, sketching a portrait or staging a scene for a film or framing allows you to direct the viewer's attention. In cinema, it's not only what you show, but also what you deliberately choose to not show that create mystery and engagement. So framing is uh, also the act of putting a window between you and uh, the world around you. So like uh, giving you a tunnel vision, it negates the space around you to focus on is what is within the frame. And uh, what we have here is uh, this, this uh, well, world famous painting of Le Radeau de la Méduse uh, in the Louvre in Paris with, with a frame of heavy golden frame here, which uh, um, gives you that, that window and also, also f gets you to focus within that. And I wanted to kind of show this image here um, to, to highlight the importance of the frame, which used to be so important in uh, times past, as you can see here. But today, funnily enough, strangely, but well, I, I guess strangely, I don't really know why or how, but we have kind of lost sort of the frame around and we focus what is within the frame uh, more when we go to the cinema, uh, on our phones, on our screens. We've kind of lost the frame um, not so much in architecture because the frame is is the the wall uh, uh, behind it. So uh, so I thought that was an interesting yeah. idea to start with. Yeah, the um, the frame is implicit nowadays. So maybe that's why also people don't think about framing a, a, a lot when you paint something or draw something. Uh, framing comes naturally when you extract something from reality which is, for example, taking a, a picture or um, a video with your smartphone, which is a, a very common thing today, uh, you don't uh, often think about framing, that is selecting what is um, what makes sense or what is, you know, interesting or and uh, what is not, uh, what doesn't make sense, what you want to exclude from the picture. So in the, in the cinema, 
and uh, photography also we we think about uh, what in the frame and what's outside which is 90 percent of uh, of the possibility of uh, of seeing things around you you eliminate almost everything uh, for the um, the the act by the act of of framing right? which is a very important series of choice uh, choices to make uh, to exclude something deliberately from the from the frame from the window uh, from the drawing from the painting from the screen you know but uh, as you said, uh, so, sorry uh, as you said when the frame is not so uh, important uh, as a notion you forget uh, about uh, the importance of making choices when you frame something and and it's funny you say about taking away because i used to sit next to a photographer uh, in my in the studio for for many years and we used to always joke about the fact that for him the work after he took the shot was uh, to take things out to take th mm -hmm. some of he would airbrush things out of the you know delete things and really uh, and and then for me it was always ab about adding things about adding some of the irregular irregularities or or I don't know, if leaves on the floor to make it more real because we start in 3D with a completely blank, black scene with nothing at all. It's like before the Big Bang. <laughs> and, and the drawing as well, exactly. So, and, and very um, interestingly, actually, when uh, in the drawing, the, f the, the pros or the, the, the kind of confirmed drawers would always draw the frame first even inside on the sheet of paper whereas uh, some of the um a, a kind of usual mistake when you're um a beginner is to not draw the frame and then very often this the edges will be very loose and will be will kind of will not be able to uh, take into consideration the next step which is composition which We've agreed we're not going to go into depth today <laughs> about, but the act of drawing the frame allows you to get this reference to uh, use against. Um, and also in drawing sometimes, for example, we actually use the edge of whether it's the paper or the pad to be able to draw a vertical line, which is, again, if you read some of the John Singer Sargent sort of writings, he said, la ligne, la plomb. The, the plumb line is is kind of the you know the, the one of the essential tools of the uh, professional portrait artist to be able to assess verticals so so the the edge of this frame as well being a hard line a hard sort of straight line as well vertical line is going to be uh, fundamental in setting out the drawing in the you know le radeau de la méduse here you see a classic framing which uh, centers um, the composition and you, you see um, everything is inside the frame, you know. And But you also showed me a uh, Degas uh, painting where the choices, the framing choices are different, where you see only um, a partial uh, portions of things, you know, of, of objects, of people. And that's very interesting because a wide, wide frame like this to cut people, you know, to put them in the lower part of the frame or to like the, the, the left uh, viewer we, uh, is cut by um, a vertical line, as you just talked about. With, uh, this vertical cut is very uh, violent, um, uh, you know, in a way it's a, a, a punk, <laughs> a punk framing because it's so uh, surprising to 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 make all these choices about what to exclude partially, what to cut, where to cut, and uh, um, everything seems to to be loose and at the same time to be very controlled because the the the, the choice the, the framing choices are so strict, you know. So and the what in the frame speaks for what's left outside. So we don't need to see. Um, more and the imagination can do the rest so that's uh, typically a, a, a framing that uh, asks the, the spectator to be active you know um, and the, the radeau de la méduse on the other side uh, 
offers uh, an already cooked meal uh, to, just to to enjoy if I can <laughs> use this term about uh, a catastrophe like the Lorado de la Meduse, but it, it's you know it's um, ready made to ready for uh, to consume ready made spectacle whereas this one i mean for the little story this is a painting by uh, edgar degas uh, for those of you who, who don't know this i mean i didn't know it it's one of not one of his typical kind of uh, you know dancer or horses but um uh, this really uh, completely um, changed my understanding of framing uh, because of the things you've just explained, the the, the way of very obviously he cut. But uh, it's interesting to know that Edgar Degas was uh, just at the same time as the Impressionist, but or maybe a little bit before. And um, the, his uh, he was beginning to use uh, photography and cameras so uh, to me the framing of this has almost uh, much more of a, a kind of journalistic look about it it's more like the sort of Cartier Bresson type you know there's movement um, and there's very awkward things like superpositions like the the umbrella goes through her head, which is just a <laughs> very, very strange thing to have done. Uh, but also, I was reading up about it, and uh, the hat is hiding a, a, a sculpture behind. Mm. And uh, here, the sculpture that is behind is very significant to a, um, a fait divers that was happening at the time. As something about Poland and the sculpture being of uh, something Polish. So this was almost a political statement, uh, uh, this this picture. But um, in in terms of the the, I think the framing was must have been sort of quite revolutionary uh, for something at the time, and very strangely, almost still is uh, yeah. for for us because it would take a huge amount of. Um, a daring and a breaking of rules to do something like this uh, today. Yeah, you spoke about Poland. May I just uh, show a, a quick example about a, re a relatively recent Polish film, uh, which is called uh, Ida. I don't know if you, you saw this one. Uh, it, it's a very beautiful uh, uh, film, but it's composed um, you know, like this Degas painting with, you know, off-centered and of, uh, often a bit, um, you know, audacious way to, to frame, you know, this, this kind of, um, of uh, you know, a, a lot of um, sky, as we said, air, you know, uh, above the, the, the faces. Uh, above the, the objects, which um, underlines the, the weight of the sky, you know, because it's about a, a young a novice, I don't know if it's a French word, who is about to commit to, you know, in a convent, and uh, her old aunt uh, suggests to, to her to live before renouncing uh, the earthly pleasures to, so she she uh, spends 15 days with uh, her aunt in uh, in, Vars in Varsovia but you, you see these framings uh, they are heavily uh, and so also it's almost uh, square it's also square yes and uh, yeah the, as, you, as you see the, the framing is, is very uh, the sky is is very heavy, so it's a, it's an interesting uh, way also to speak, you know about it's it's still very um, uh, audacious to to frame uh, like this in the cinema even even now even uh, I would say how many years after the Degas painting but it still looked as a, some very uh, very audacious yes yeah. I'll keep this there. Um, so, so yeah, I've just got a, a couple of more images and then we'll go into the Unreal scene. Um, can you see my screen there? So, 
I'll share my screen. Yeah, so again, sorry for the bad quality of this picture, but this is a, by a fantastic designer called Studio KO, uh, an old client of mine in, based in Paris. And they're very, very good at the, doing this framing. And uh, here we've got the fr window within um, the, the larger frame, but also a very, very strong segmentation of the planes. We've got the front, you know, the foreground, middle ground and background. And this is, again, something that makes for another subject we'll talk about um, which is depth and composition mm. and so on like this but uh, I wanted to kind of uh, show that and another um, concept that is incredibly well treated by uh, Hitchcock always yeah. the, the theme of the window is uh, comes keeps coming in his work uh, and so we've got the window within the frame uh, here, taking it further, and uh, something when we were preparing, we we uh, came up with is uh, the scene in in Vertigo, where again there's a very strong uh, way of framing the story when we see how she comes and looks at the painting with with the the flowers. It's, she's got the same flowers, isn't it? That's the thing. And uh, and he's here, and we're watching all of that behind. And I thought it was interesting that this sort of image cutout came up of the that frame of of her watching herself and things like that. Yeah. But uh, here, the the masterful uh, composition of of um, of these sort of repeated frames here, and again the treatment of the foreground uh, with uh, with the information that puts us into this context, into this position of the viewer in, looking over his shoulder. It's just, it's really masterful. How, uh, um, and and yeah, this is, I like to talk about drawing as well all the time, but um, one thing we were told repeatedly in class is study the masters, so. Yeah, each cook are, are the masters, yeah. Can I, can I share my screen again? I, I just wanted to to show you um, um, some pictures of In the Mood for Love by Wong Kar Wai, which is a, a movie from uh, the year 2000. And uh, it, it speaks about a, a, a couple uh, which has to live uh, very discreetly. And uh, Can you put your image full screen? Uh, almost here. It's better. Uh, this couple has to live uh, in a uh, very discreetly, you know, and uh, so I found a video uh, called In the Mood for Love Frames Within, within Frames, where this uh, internal framing is highlighted uh, in many ways, and it's very interesting. So uh, I didn't want to, I, I wanted to cite, you know, the sources, like this is uh, Kubrick, this is John Ford, uh, framing with his framing, Within framing is a, um, a way to to show um, the limitation of uh, movements, for example, for of characters which which are not um, allowed to express, for example, fully their uh, sentiments. You know, or like this uh, to be to have the impression to be uh, uh, watched uh, by a neighbor. You know, with a with a viewing glass. Uh, through a window and uh, to be uh, spied on, you know. So it, it's a um, it's a, a very interesting way to to frame people within frames, and this is very emblematic about uh, about it. Mm. Yeah, I let I leave you again. It's it's really we we didn't want to talk about uh, composition in this uh, short video. We just wanted to take about you know the frame itself. Mm. Well, we we want. I think we can do a whole a whole video on composition itself. But uh, I think it, talking about framing, we would very easily just go straight into composition. But I think it's an interesting. Uh, subject to to really yeah. geek out on <laughs> and just be uh, let, um, the takeaway could be you know be conscious of the the existence of the frame when you uh, 
when you frame something, when you compose something for a, a visual, you know, be it a static one or a film, be uh, very conscious of the borders of, uh, of the frame, what you want to exclude and what you uh, want to include and uh, what's meaningful uh, for you, what you will uh, draw attention to, uh, because you, you have to follow uh, one idea, you know, to, to defend one thing by, uh, by picture, um, instead of just taking something, you know, like an, an automatic pilot. Yeah, just apply the rule of third blindly. And, and uh, this, I think there's an opportunity here, again, just one final master. Um, Henri Cartier-Bresson here, which really, uh, again, I mean, for me, is, is it really is always <laughs> the ultimate master. But here, the the frame doesn't have to be square. Or, or here again, the, this kind of viewing in, uh, you know, it, how <laughs> how incredible <laughs> to use a bike frame, um, the the foreground and this sort of just incredible composition uh here with 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 this this eye being guided into the action and uh incredibly uh, modern yeah if you go back to the the boat uh with uh, the bike and the foreground uh try to put it uh, full screen if you can but uh, let's imagine this picture uh normal people would have taken this picture with the boat only because they would have you know, um, been in the closest possible to the boat because that's what they are seeing uh, and uh, forgetting about the foreground, which tells also something about, you know, distances and uh, a hierarchy about, you know, a lot of things. Uh, you, and uh, for example, I um, when you wake up in, uh, you know, uh, on a Sunday morning in, uh, in a little Swiss uh, chalet, uh, the, the windows are uh, closed you know and so you wake up in the dark and but it's almost 10 a.m so you look at the outside and you see a sun sun rays entering the 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 room so you you go to the to the window you open the shade and wow there is a full uh you know sunlit uh landscape before you and you a mountain and you take your smartphone and you just go on the balcony and take a picture of the mountain, but you forgot that it's the framing of uh, the, from the inside uh, and the, the, the journey you took from your bed to the outside that is interesting, not the resulting uh, mountain, you know, because the mountain is not interesting at all. It's um, a way to tell a story with a, a picture which would have be taken from the a little bit from the inside of the window and putting you know the shades in a way that they enter the frame and so you will have the feeling uh, you had when you discovered the yourself when you lived the moment of discovery of revelation uh, and uh, because the 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 mountain itself is boring but the the act of discovering it was the surprise so you have to frame to tell this story right i was gonna say the mountain is boring in the context of storytelling which brings us to the 3d because interestingly it's difficult almost arguably possibly impossible to tell a story in a fully immersed 360 environment without any constraints of any kind at all uh you know in a video game i guess environments like that are first person shooter you know like valorant or um or uh, fortnite where you can go anywhere you want and there's no real story other than the people you're going to encounter which are they're going to give you the focus because they're shooting at you <laughs> you're gonna die um but uh, it, it's true that it is very difficult to tell a story if you can't divert people's attention. So in a game, in a, in a free roaming environment, you're always going to have some kind of something shiny, something directing you from one thing to the other. But as soon as you put the frame on, then the story begins. 
in a way. Yep. And, and you're right, when uh, you are in, uh, for example, in this scene in Unreal, uh, you, you made it interesting from uh, every angle, so everything is possible and uh, you can even make the sun, you know, rise on the, <laughs> and, uh, or the moon and uh, you can light or darken everything, so everything is possible. So that's a good example of uh, um, uh, endless possibilities. So when uh, it's as uh, in Starbucks, you know, when uh, you were just want a coffee and you have to answer 37 different questions about, uh, you know, uh, the milk, the sugar, the the quantity of uh, of water and uh, everything, but you just want a coffee. So the same thing here, you, you want, you, for example, to tell something, you have to know what, of course, about uh, this space. And since there is nobody around, uh, you have to focus and maybe uh, and to ask about what's what's um, your visuals, um, what your visuals are about, you know, what do you have to convey of, uh, you know, about emotions, about, uh, you know, possibilities in, in this space? Do you want to put the emphasis or on the, uh, you know, um, on the furniture or on the, on the art or on the huge uh, walking space? Are there um, the, the visuals you are going to make about to sell the idea of the feasibility of uh, of a piece of, of you know of architecture like this one including for example a, a huge tree inside the building and uh, or is it more about selling a possibility of co-working in a, in a very uh, you know cozy place so the the, the perspective uh, of what uh, you are about to tell is so important because um, it limits the possibilities so it will focus you it will allow you to focus on a, a specific um, part of the visual and to, to frame it and to light it to to make it uh, you know uh, tell something mm -hmm. This scene in particular, uh, because as as you probably see, as Pascal is talking, we have multiple stories potentially going on here. Uh, so one of the things that uh, I always appreciate working with Pascal is that you always ask me to put a camera and um, have a long lens. Is that how you call it? Yes, a uh, long focal. Long focal. Yeah. Yes. Uh, to and this gives you the uh, op uh, ability to, I guess, sort of. You see, everything is more interesting when you when you are like this. You are framing because, as we said at the beginning, you are excluding a lot uh, from uh, your picture, and you are focusing uh, on, on on parts that you weren't uh, aware about you know at, at the beginning of your exploration of this uh, this space yes so so then that's again that's how you begin to start telling stories uh, within the frame although here it's unclear what the story we're telling exactly because yeah it's um when you light everything, for example, if you light the background, uh, if you put a um, you know a daylight in the background, it's even more messy because you are um, unable to direct the eye in in any way. And uh, the the more you the more you have um, you know um, items in your uh, composition. The, the more you have to give the eye um, a way to enter your 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 picture, and uh, for example here you have only the the light on the foreground, and some some light in the background which gives uh, depth, which is interesting. And this frame, for example, is interesting. It's a bit off balance, but it gives a, a sense of um, uh, depth and. Uh, so that's very, very, very interesting. But what does it tell about the space? You know, it's uh, it's more about furniture and uh, interior decoration 
um, but since it's um, you know night, uh, it's a bit uh, menacing. For example, or, you know, it, it could be an uh, it could be, yeah, exactly, and this could be a horror a movie, you know, because of the outside woods with fog and uh, you feel safe inside but you you know that you you will be in danger for example going outside or we, we could focus for example on the statue and uh, choosing a, a low angle uh, putting the statue on the first you know uh, uh, first part of the of the picture and seeing high above the the branches of the of the tree you know if you go close to the statue and with a low angle and see in the foreground the statue and in the background the the tree which will make a very intriguing picture you know which uh, because maybe some 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 people recognize um, the sculpture which is well known but in this setting it will look like a very um, disturbing uh disturbing picture so it, it's a way of knowing uh you know um that you are free to move uh, and that includes of course the height of uh, the camera and that's very easy in a in a software like uh, unreal of course where you can put the camera absolutely uh I think I'm actually underground. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. That, why not? And then with this frame, for example, if you keep this frame, which is uh, uh, relatively interesting because it's off balance, and uh, you know, on the left you have the statue, on the right you have a, a heavy trunk. So why not? Then change the lighting. For example, you know, you uh, put uh, the sun. Uh, in the background and uh, uh, cho let's choose for example not to light the statue and and let's let do the this you know the the sun reflections on the ground for example uh, to light the statue by, by itself i i know i i don't know i i will you know that's yeah that's a, a um, setting sun yes on the la on the the right part of the frame yes where is it ah. there yes okay mm -hmm. uh, and if you switch off the, the lights on the statue and let let the only the sun uh light the scene you know Okay, she is in the. Normally, there is uh, still a, a light on the you know on the statue because I, I see she, she it's um it's lit from above. You you see that on the. Yeah. Yes. And she is also lit from the side, I think. But let's let's say it's okay. Um, <laughs> no, there is no sunlight. Okay. I have to find the remaining light. Okay, mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. And and if you turn the camera on, the, ah, okay, that's interesting. Also, you know, uh, we we are talking about frames within frames, and uh, it's this is interesting because uh, this lighting, uh, you know highlights the the importance of the frames behind her so it's also a way to to uh, frame her very uh, effectively you know it's interesting and it's a bit um, enigmatic because you don't know where these frames come from uh, until you see the structure of the building of course so maybe this the pictures we 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 try to do like this one could only be envisioned in a series of pictures about this space and not standalone picture because it's too cryptic, you know, because you don't understand the, the space around the statue. Mm -hmm. 
Great. All right. Well, we were only going to speak for 15, 20 minutes. We're overshot as predicted. Um, but um, yeah, I hope um, that was of interest. There's, uh, there's always something I learn whenever I speak to Pascal. So uh, we'll be. Uh, this is a first of hopefully many. And I uh, hope we'll be um, creating uh, more interesting things like that in the future. So. Uh, thank you very much, Pascal. Any closing uh, closing remarks? Oh, I, I just saw the reflection of the trees on the marble on the left, and it gave me it gave me an instant uh, other idea. So we will go that in the upcoming videos. <laughs> Excellent. All right. See you all very soon. Thank you, Pascal. Yeah, thank you to all of you. Thank you very much. Bye.